Bible to 2 Peter, if you would, this evening. If you need a copy of the notes, you raise up your hand, somebody will get them. Got everyone covered. 2 Peter 1, 1. Let's, let's start there. I will read through several of these verses, and then uh, we will uh, we'll pray, and then we'll get to where we're going tonight. <clears throat> As I re- I'm going to read through verse 11. I uh, encourage you, as I go through this, just pay attention to the fact that Peter uses the word knowledge. I'll come back to that as we go through this. But verse 1 of Second Peter reads like this. Second Peter 1.1 1, 1. Simon Peter, a servant and, apost- and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained, a, uh, obtained like precious faith, with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. According to his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to his glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall neither fall, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, might you bless the reading of your word tonight. Might you open our eyes this evening. Lord, might you open our eyes to understand the truth of your word. Might you anoint me to be able to explain this introduction to this fabulous letter that is before us. What a privilege we have of being able to study your word tonight. Lord, might we not forget that, that we are truly privileged, that we are blessed because we have a Bible, because the Spirit of God is with us to teach us and instruct us. So, Lord, we'll commit our study to you, this beginning of this, and, Lord, might it be one that is a real blessing to each of us as we go through 2 Peter in the weeks and the months to come, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, here in a moment, I will get to your paper, but before I do, let me say this. Introductions are something that I often struggle with because I search things out, and they're Sometimes there's a lot to uncover. Sometimes there is, seems to be very little to uncover. This introduction, I came across a lot of information that is very, very helpful whenever it comes to studying this letter. Just, I gave you a little bit of a hint here, and we'll touch on this in the end. That word knowledge that is used through there, I don't, I didn't count four, maybe four times in those verses that I read uh, when it's something's repeated that much, there's a reason for it, and you'll see why as we get into this tonight. So tonight, what we're going to do, a few things that we didn't do in First Peter. We're going to look at a few things, like uh, we're going to get to the writer here in a moment. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Peter, get some interesting facts about him. We will talk about where the letter was written from. Uh, that's very significant. We'll talk about why Peter wrote the letter, what was on his mind. We'll talk about what the critics say, a little bit about what the critics say about this letter uh, as we go through this. So let me just, with that said, let me start you on the top of the page with the introduction to Second Peter. Here's what it says. This evening, we're going to start a study in Second Peter, but before we get into the letter, I want to give you some information to set the stage for a study in this letter. So we're going to look at, first of all, at the writer. Okay, now before I say this, before I get into that, let me say this. In the book of, in the Old Testament, the book that receives the most criticism 
from the critics would be the book of Daniel. In the New Testament, it may surprise you, but it is Second Peter. Second Peter is the book that is under the microscope more than any other letter. And the reason is because many people say Peter did not write this letter. He, they could, he couldn't, they say he couldn't have wrote the letter because it's so different language-wise than the first letter. We're going to talk about why that is, too. I think there's a very good explanation for that. But for that reason, a lot of people have wanna, they've, they've want to, a lot of, even what people that consider themselves Bible teachers have wanted to take this letter and throw it out, say it has no part, no part in God's Word whatsoever, no part in the canon of Scripture, because they don't believe that Peter wrote the letter. There is, I'll say this, there is very little external evidence. There is one that we're going to talk about tonight. I think that there is internal evidence that solidifies the fact that Peter did write the letter, and I'm going to show you that internal evidence. So, with that said, watch 1-1. One, one. Here's what it says. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So, the first verse, Peter identifies himself as the reader, or somebody forged his name, one of the two. I would lean towards the first one. Peter identified himself. Nobody forged his name. But let me bring you back to your pay, back to the paper. Watch this. Here we see that Peter claims to be the writer of the letter, and I'm going to show you how we can be sure that Peter is the writer by examining some internal evidence. So I'm going to give you two examples of internal evidence in the letter that I think solidifies the fact that Peter wrote the letter. So first of all, and you can follow along in your Bible. I've put them on the screen. It makes sometimes it makes it easier for me to be able to relate back and forth instead of all the flipping, but you can turn in your Bible if you want. But Second Peter chapter 1, 13 and 14, watch what he writes. He said, Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Okay, now stop for a moment. So that, that second verse, verse 14 right there, tells me this. Peter wrote this letter very close to the end of his life. Very close to the end of his life. That is significant. I came across some interesting information about words from, I'll call it words from a deathbed, uh, which is almost what you have right here. But I didn't realize this, but in our court system, if, if, uh, if an attorney is, is presenting a case and he uses somebody's words that is not there as a witness, that is known as hearsay. And that holds very little, that carries very little weight. As a matter of fact, that is often thrown out because it's known as hearsay. But... If it is known that the words were spoken when the individual was on his deathbed, then there is an exception to that clause, and the words can be used. That's interesting. Because a lot of times what somebody says on their deathbed are words that we need to listen very closely to. Peter, he's not in a bed, but we could say these are the words from his deathbed. He's at the end of his life. He realizes that he's at the end of his life, and he speaks these words. That's not why I showed you that verse, though. I'm showing you that there is internal evidence. So back to verse 14 on the screen. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Now, let me show you a parallel text, if I could. John 21, uh, 15 through 19. Now watch. So you remember what he said there in verse... Uh, 14 of chapter 1 of 2 Peter. Now watch John 21, 15 through 19. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. 
He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Now watch this. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This he spake, signifying what death he should glorify God. When he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. So, okay, now listen to me. Jesus was explaining in verses 18 and 19 on the screen that there was coming a day, the Lord says, when you will be old, Peter, and you will stretch forth your hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whether thou wouldest not. Now, tradition says that Peter died being crucified upside down, he and his wife both. They were going to execute him by crucifixion, and tradition says that he did not feel... Uh, worthy to be crucified as his lord so they crucified him upside down that is tradition that is not biblical okay but here in this text god the lord says to him jesus says to him this is the way you're going to die now come back to verse 14 again in in your bible or else i'll show it to you on the screen watch this knowing this shortly i must put off this my tabernacle even as our lord jesus christ has showed me so I say this, verse 14 reflects back to John 21, really 18 and 19. So I would say this to you, I think that is one internal evidence without a doubt that it is Peter that is writing the letter. Let me give you internal evidence number two. I'll take you to 2 Peter chapter 1. Now we'll go to 15 through 18. Watch this. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Okay, so Peter says this, I was in the holy mount. Now watch Matthew 17, 15 through 20, 17, 1 through 5. Watch the verses. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth him up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, his raiment was white as light, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He wanted to keep them. He didn't want them to leave. That's why he wanted to build the tabernacles. While he yet spake, behold, a light, a bright cloud, which overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So, Matthew 17, I think, is exactly what Peter is describing whenever you come to chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. So I believe, without a doubt, that those are two internal evidences that show us that Peter, without a doubt, wrote the letter. Okay, now come back to your paper. <clears throat> These are two internal evidences that Peter is the writer of the letter. There is very little external evidence, but there is one other biblical writer we can look to for external evidence. So 2 Peter 2.1 now. This is really the reason why he wrote the letter, which you're going to read right here, and we'll get into that in a little bit. It says this, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be shall be okay they're coming shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction so peter quotes that now six years later jude writes his letter watch what jude writes jude chapter one there's only one chapter verse four for there are certain men crept in unawares, 
who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So it, is, it looks like, and, and many believe this, I'll read what I have here. It's believed that Jude is referencing Second Peter when he writes these words. Peter says that false teachers are coming. Jude tells us they are already here. Six years later, they had arrived. Peter said, there shall be false witnesses among you. Jude says, there are certain men crept in unaware. Six years later, Jude is looking back and saying, look, this is exactly what Peter was concerned about. That's basically, that's basically what he is saying in the midst of that. So you have a little bit of internal evidence with those two parallel passages from John and, and from Matthew, and then you have that one external where it looks very, very much like Jude was quoting Peter whenever he, whenever he wrote the letter, whenever Jude wrote warning about the false teachers that would come. So, back to your paper again. Watch this. Now, I also need to address the point the critics make about Second Peter. They say that First Peter and Second Peter are different in language. Or in other words, they are linguistically different. For this reason, the critics want to throw Second Peter out and say that it should not be part of the Bible. They will accept that Peter wrote First Peter, but not Second Peter. So, how do we answer this criticism? I think it's very easy. We go back to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12, and here's what it says. That letter that we just closed out and we looked at this verse last week, by Silvanus or Silas, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I have written briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true, true grace of God wherein you stand. Here is the answer. Peter used a scribe by the name of Silvanus or Silas to write 1 Peter. This explains the difference in the language because Peter wrote 2 Peter with his own hand. So that would, that, that would explain it crystal clear. Silas, he's dictating to Silas what is, what, is, what is to be recorded in the first letter. The next letter, he writes it with his own hand. And I give you all of that because I want you to understand, while we live in our little bubble, you may have never heard about all the criticism about 2 Peter. But there could be somebody come in here and they could say, you know what? I don't believe that this book is written by Peter himself and really should not even be in the Scriptures. And now you know that there is internal evidence, there is a, there is a hint of external evidence, and if they say, well, the language is different, it's, it, the linguistics are different, then, yeah, rightly so, because Sy Sylvanus was the scribe that wrote the first letter as it was dictated to him. He would have been able to put Peter's words in his own writing as the Spirit of God guided him. But the second letter is written by the hand of Peter himself. So that would explain the difference. And I give you all of that because you and I need that. Because if you've not encountered that opposition yet, chances are you will. It'll come down the road sometime, somehow, some way, it'll show up. And there's a reason why God laid it on my heart to teach it to you. Who knows what's coming down the road? So that brings me to the next thing that I want to consider. Facts concerning Peter. We didn't do this in the first letter, but I want to do it in this letter. I want to show you some interesting things about Peter. So let me, let me start right here. The 12 apostles are listed four times in the Bible. That is the whole list of them starting from the beginning to the end. Three times in the Gospels, once in Acts. Now watch this. In each of the listings, when you have a full recorded list, Peter is always named first. Always. He's always first. This tells us Peter was the leader of the group. He was the leader of the group. Sometimes Peter talked before his mind was even engaged. I've often heard people say that Peter was the apostle with the mouth that was shaped like a foot because he was always putting his foot in his mouth. And he did that many times. Peter made a lot of mistakes in his life, but he got it together as time went on. The, the thing that, that, is in, that is an encouragement to me about Peter is the fact that he never quit. He might have been down, but he was never out. He was restored, his, his, his fellowship with the Lord was restored. Do you remember 
when Jesus was, whenever he was run through the mock trials and Peter denied the Lord three times and after the resurrection, and my mind slips me to tell you which gospel it is in, but after Jesus had rose and met with some of them, he said, go and tell the apostles or the disciples and Peter, specifically tell Peter that I am alive. And then the Emmaus disciples in Luke chapter 24, whenever they came back to report to the disciples that were in the upper room, they said, the Lord hath appeared to Simon. There was a special meeting between Jesus and Peter after the resurrection, and rightly so. Peter was crushed because of what he had done, his denial. The, the, the scriptures tell us he went out and wept bitterly. But there was a special meeting, and his his faith was his his fellowship was restored and and peter was back on track again and went on and and we know just by looking at the book of acts he's the preacher and in acts chapter 2 and in acts chapter 3 we see where he has come from by the denial to where he is in those in 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 those in the beginning of the church and how god used him and i look at him and i say you know what the guy never quit he was down and he was discouraged, but he never gave up. And I say to you tonight, and no matter what, look, we all fail. There have been times uh, that we all get to a place where you, it's like, you know what? I just don't feel like going on. But you can't get to the point where you quit. You cannot do that. You've got to keep going. Let me go on here. Peter is a member of a group of three apostles that were privileged to see things which the others did not. The group was made up of Peter, James, and John. Let us notice one such miracle the three were permitted to see. It was the raising of Jairus' daughter in Mark chapter 5. Watch this. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter, James, and and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth a tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, that's Peter, James, and John, and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked. For she was of the age of 12 years. They were astonished with a great astonishment. So there is one situation, and there were others. Watch your paper. Another such occasion was the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John again. So he was a part of the inner group. He was a part of the inner group. That night in the garden, whenever Jesus came under the spiritual attacks, you remember after they left the upper room, and he came to the garden, and he dropped off nine of the disciples. Then he took Peter, James, and John further into the garden. I've often said that that was a picture of how he took them further into the darkness. And sometimes, as believers, there are those that go further into the darkness in the sense that they go further into suffering. But there are things that are witnessed, there are things that are learned in the midst of those valleys that you don't get if you're dropped off with the other nine at the gate. What you learn in those valleys is vitally important. Important. What you learn in those situations are things that you never have to write down because they are forever etched in your mind. I can assure you, Peter never had to write about Jairus' daughter. He would never forget what he witnessed that day. He would never have to write down what he witnessed on the Mount of Transfiguration because what he witnessed there was forever etched in his mind. And I will say this to you, that there have been people that have had to walk into some deep, dark valleys in their life. And what they have learned in the midst of those valleys, they never had to write down. Because it was forever in their minds. 
they would not forget. They would not forget how God worked in their life and how his hand was on them and the things that he did and the doors that he opened and the ways that he provided. And if you get dropped off at the gate with the other nine, you don't get to see all of those things. Peter was a man that was privileged. Watch the next paragraph. Another interesting fact is that Peter denied the Lord three times, then went on to become a very powerful preacher. It was Peter who preached in Acts 2 and 3, where thousands are saved. What does this mean to us? It tells us that God is not looking for perfect people to use. He works through people who are flawed and know it. He looks at the heart and desires to use people who have a heart that is after his. The reason God is not looking for perfect people is because there are no perfect people. We are all flawed. Therefore, he can use each of us if we are willing to walk in his truth. Don't forget that. Because sometimes we can be our own worst critics. And sometimes other people also can be critical. And we tend to think that you've got to be perfect in order to be used by God. People will often look at a pastor and think, well... I could never do that. And I say this, if you were called to be a pastor and you were a man, a natural-born man, i got to say that nowadays, uh, that you could do it too. Because he would equip you to be able to do whatever he calls you to do. But whatever he wants you to do, listen to me, you don't, he's, not, he's not looking for somebody that is perfect because if he was, he would not use any of us. He will use flawed individuals. He will use you. He uses me. And I can assure you that you are looking at a flawed individual right now. By no means am I perfect. You ask my wife, she will back that up anytime, I'm sure. Uh, but Peter is a great example. Like I said, he never quit. He never gave up. He never gave up, no matter how difficult it became. And Peter was used in a very powerful way, especially there in the beginning of the early church uh, to reach so many people with the gospel. There's one more thing. Watch this. One more thing about Peter. He was given the keys to the kingdom. Talk about a privileged individual. Watch Matthew 16, 18, and 19. It says, And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, that's not Peter that the church was built on. That was Christ himself. Jesus is the rock that the church is built on. But let me go back to this. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what does it mean that he was given the keys to the kingdom? What does that mean? Watch this. Peter opened the door to the Jews to become members of the church in Acts 2. He opened the door to the Samaritans to be members of the church in Acts 8, and he opened the door to the Gentiles to be members of the church in Acts 10. He was the one that led the pioneer advancement in each of those, to each of those three groups of people. He was given the keys to the kingdom. That's what it means. He unlocked the doors, the door to the Jews. He unlocked the door to the Samaritans. He unlocked the door to the Gentiles for all of them to become members of the church. So going back to our writer, Peter is the writer, no doubt about that, I don't think. Peter is the writer, he's a privileged individual, he has experienced a lot of things in his life, he knows what failure is all about, he knows what restored fellowship is all about, he knows what it is to continue to be steadfast and not quit, he knows all about that. He's at the end of his life. He's not quitting. He just knows that it's at that time. It's time to put off the earthly tabernacle. It's time to put off the body and to move on into eternity, just like the Lord had showed him. These are his last words, so to speak. Now, let me go to something else tonight. That's the place of the writing. Watch your paper. I want to take you take a few minutes and correct something that I said last week because I believe I said something that was inaccurate and I'm going to show you why I say that in first Peter both letters were written from the same place first Peter 5 12 through 14 
It says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose, I've written briefly, exhorting and testifying, that this is a true grace of God wherein you stand. The church, the church that is at Babylon ex elected together with you salutes you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let me read the next line. Last week I told you that Babylon was like a code name for Rome. And that's what a lot of people teach. As a matter of fact, I have a Ryrie study Bible in front of me, and in Ryrie's notes, he will tell you that Babylon is Rome. And I don't claim to know more than Ryrie by any means. But I don't think that's accurate. And what I said last week I don't think was accurate. Whenever I said that that was a code name for Rome. And watch, I'm going to show you why I say this. Let me keep reading. Many Bible teachers will tell us that Babylon was Rome, but there's a problem with that. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, talking about the recipients of both letters, says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Okay, back to your paper. These are geographic locations, are the geographic locations of the believers Peter was writing to, and we understand these places to be literal places. Nobody would disagree with that. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, all up north. Okay, so with that said, so why would we not understand Babylon in chapter 5 to literally mean Babylon? The question, uh, let me just stop for a moment because I want to go on to something else here. So you see what I'm saying? In P 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, we take that literal, those areas where the believers were scattered abroad, Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. That's literal. But then we want to come to 1 Peter 5, verse 13, and take Babylon and say, well, you can't take that literal. Really, that makes no sense, does it? Whenever the Bible wants us to see something in and in in, in allegorize it, the Bible will tell us all about that. It will tell us whenever we are permitted to do that. Here, we are not permitted to do that. And so whenever I told you last week that that was Rome, I will come back and I say this right now, that I was wrong. I think that is Babylon. That is Babylon. So that brings me back here to the paper again. So watch in the middle of that bottom paragraph. How did the church end up in Babylon? How did it end up over there? Okay, now watch this. If we remember when we studied Esther, we talked about how many of the Jews never went back to Jerusalem. They made a choice to stay in Babylon. But how did the church get started there? That's a question. So let me take you on a little bit of a journey here, and I think you can see exactly what happened whenever the church began in Acts chapter 2, 4 through 9, and then verse 41. Watch these verses. It says this, They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Stop right there for a moment. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, okay? You say, okay, but get, get a little bit more particular. Okay, let's keep going. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia. You know where that is? That's Babylon. That was Babylon. So there were Babylonian Jews that were there at Pentecost that heard Peter's sermon. Now watch this. And in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So what you had was this. That first, that, that first sermon on the day of Pentecost, whenever Peter preached, when, when the Spirit of God was moving, then 
in that crowd there were jews that were from babylon that had stayed there their their ancestors had stayed there after the captivity they never came back we know that because we could go to the genealogies that are in ezra and are in the book of nehemiah and you would see that they did not all come back many of them stayed they became comfortable in babylon you remember they made it very comfortable for them in babylon because they wanted them to become babylonians and so they stayed there but they were still jews and so they came to jerusalem for pentecost because that was required that they had to come to jerusalem for pentecost they were there they heard the gospel they got saved they went back to babylon guess what they did they started churches whenever they went back so it, that helps you to understand how would the church ever end up in babylon i think it's very simple because of the the sermon that was preached on the day of pentecost and the babylonian jews were there and they heard it and 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 there was about three thousand souls that were saved so some of them no doubt out of mesopotamia in babylon and so they carried the gospel right back and they started churches and so that's why peter's writing from babylon he was the apostle to the jews they were jews that was in babylon they were in babylon and so he's over there and he writes back to those that were scattered okay one more paragraph here and then i'll get you down to the last point mesopotamia is babylon that's what i said some of them were saved went back home and started churches and this is how the church came about in babylon therefore peter wrote first and second peter both from babylon and i think you need to take that literal whenever he says that in in first peter chapter 5 uh verse 13 the church that is in babylon i think we take that literal because there's the bible doesn't tell us not to and we take the the, ge the geographic locations of the readers in chapter 1, verse 1, literal. So why would we switch it up at the end? And so I wanted to give you that because I always talk about literal interpretation. And if you don't keep that, if you break the bands of literal interpretation, then the sky's the limit. You can't do that. We got to stay literal. And so I made a mistake last week and I correct that. That brings me to the next point. Number three, the reason for writing why did he write it why did he write this letter the first one's about suffering you remember that i told you the first letter was written a lot of people think before the uh persecution that came under nero but it was it was setting them up to to live in a way that glorified god whenever the persecution did come some people say the persecution was already there that was the fiery trial whether it was there whether it was not eventually if it wasn't it was coming if it was it was already there so he wrote the first letter to teach them how to suffer in a godly way how to stay steadfast and and live in a way that honored god in the midst of the suffering this letter is a little bit different uh and i missed the verse so it's on your paper second peter 2 1 it says but there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you catch that that uh future tense shall be watch this who privately shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction so peter is concerned for this reason i'm gonna i'll get back to the paragraph in a moment peter is concerned because there is a movement in his day there is a movement and he knows that it is going to reach the church it's going to get to the church it is a false teaching what is it watch your paragraph here's why peter wrote this letter it is because there was a false teaching that was fast approaching his audience the false teaching was gnosticism that's what we talked about this morning it got into the church at corinth also remember this the gnostics taught dualism this teaching stated that the physical world is bad and the spiritual world is good that's why in corinthians like we talked about this morning the 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 gnostics those that were into dualism had convinced the corinthians that because the physical world was bad there would be no resurrection that's why 
Paul said, how say some of you there is no resurrection? Because they said, hey, the body's bad. Why would it ever be resurrected? And so that's why Paul taught that entire chapter, because that had crept into the church, that dualism. Now watch this. This kind of teaching does great damage to a person's Christian doctrine. These people taught that Jesus was not coming back to rule in the earth because the earth is bad. So this teaching denies the earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ. This is where all millennialism comes from today. There is nothing new under the sun. Okay, listen, let me tell you something else. The word Gnostic means knowledge. Remember whenever I read 1 through 11, and I said, watch for the word knowledge. The Gnostics, and I want you to listen real close to this, believed that they had a knowledge that nobody else had. They prided themselves in knowledge. And they believed that they had a, they had a knowledge that, that they were a level above everybody else. They had, they had truth that nobody else, others had not yet come to. And so they were going around trying to lead these people into this truth that they claimed that they had that other people did not have. And they, they claimed that it was based on knowledge. That's why Peter uses the word knowledge so many times in this letter, because he's saying, here's true knowledge. If you want true knowledge, it comes from God. That's where it comes from. Not from this group of Gnostics. Not from those that teach dualism. That's not where it comes from. It comes from God. And so when you go through the letter, you see that word, and you understand this is what's going on. You have a group of people that are infiltrating into the church, and they claim that they have knowledge that nobody else has. They got something new. That's, let me just say this. That is so prevalent today. It's prevalent today. I, I've seen it in the, uh, in the, uh, the uh, covenant theology movement, in the kingdom now movement, and people that believe that we are in a kingdom right now. They think that we are there right now. This is the kingdom. I've talked to individuals that think that we are in the kingdom now. I say, wait a minute. How, how could you explain how bad things are with the, and, and say that, that we are in the kingdom right now? And the answer is this. Think they, 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 I was actually told this. Things are getting better. There was a lot of questions went through my mind at that point. But it's like, wait, wake up. Things are not getting better by any means. And, and everybody knows that. Everybody knows that, but it's all based on, and I want you to catch that, because it is so prevalent today, it's based on knowledge. Covenant theology, reform theology, it's where, that's where it's at. So be very, very careful. If you're going to listen to somebody, if you're going to read what they have, make sure you know what they believe. Make, and, and I always, I, I ask the question, you know, Where's this person stand on covenant theology, on replacement theology, believing that the church has replaced Israel? See, those that teach that say that the church didn't start in Acts chapter one, in Acts chapter two, uh, chapter one and two, but they believe the church started clear back in the Old Testament, and all those people in the Old Testament that are saved are part of the church, and they say that that God's finished with Israel and we have now replaced Israel. That's replacement theology. And all the promises that are promised to them are now for us. And they say that there will not be a literal thousand-year kingdom. They're, they're, that's not going to happen. They don't believe in the rapture. This is giving you a little bit of information. This is what's going on. And it's based on what they believe to be a higher knowledge. It's, you know this, Solomon said it, there's no new thing under the sun. It just gets wrapped up in different packages. It existed here. I want to show you how it had got in. Let, let me go back to this. Uh, right in the middle of that paragraph. This is where all millennialism comes, in, comes from today. That means all millennial means no millennium. No, no 
literal thousand year rule of Christ. That's an all millennialist, in case you're wondering. Okay, watch this. This teaching then leads many to allegorize the prophecies of God's word. In other words, they will not see many of the prophecies of, of Revelation as literal. The, the person that I talked to about that, I asked about the prophecies of Revelation. I said, what do you do about, wh what about the Antichrist? And, and what about the, the, the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bold judgments? And here was the answer. The seal judgments, the bold judgments, the trumpet judgments, they are figurative. They are not literal. They are not literal. And they say the tribulation already happened and Nero was the Antichrist. That's what they believe. I'm telling you, this is so prevalent today. We're in a bubble right here. I'm thankful God has allowed me to get outside the bubble sometimes to get a little bit of a, uh, an understanding of what's going on so that I can bring it back and I can help you with all of that. That's what caused me to start my own study, as I've said to you, on the kingdom, the coming kingdom, because that's what dominates the scriptures. That in the beginning, God established that theocratic kingdom with God ruling through the first Adam, and the first Adam failed. And so now Satan is the God of this world. And then the promise of Genesis 3.15, that there is a Messiah that is coming to destroy Satan and will then take over and, and will be the theocratic administrator, will be the ruler on the earth, and that's Jesus Christ. And, and that's the Abrahamic covenant and, and the Mosaic covenant and, and the land covenant and, and the Davidic covenant and the new covenant. They all talk, they all point to that kingdom. They're, that's what it's there for. And that's what the Bible's about. And as you flow through the scriptures, that's what it's all about. So these people take away the kingdom. And they, don't, they say, no, the Abrahamic covenant, that's no good anymore. That, that'll never come about. That, as a matter of fact, some of them say it was already fulfilled. And so it just makes a mess of things. If you don't understand it, all that said to say, and I know I've got off and ranted here, but you need to know it because it's coming. I'll, I'll be just like Peter. It's coming. There'll be somebody that'll stand here someday and they'll say, it's here, like Jude. I'm telling you it's coming. Somebody else will say it's already here. Don't let it get in here. Don't let it get in here. Back to your paper. Watch this. So, uh, in Peter's day, this led many to believe that Jesus did not have a human body because that would be bad. False teaching was a major problem in the early church. Now, you say, well, how would, they, uh, would somebody believe that Jesus didn't have a human body? Well, I'm glad you asked that. 1 John 4, 2, and 3. Watch this. Watch what John writes. He says, Hereby know ye that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. What? Yeah. You see what they denied? They said he never had a body because the body's bad. Everything, everything in this world is bad. So he couldn't have had a body. And therefore, he, he, he's, he's not resurrected, just like we talked about this morning. Let me go on. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. So it was, they bought into it then. They bought into it in Corinthians also. Watch uh, 2 John chapter 1, verse 7, only one chapter, but watch it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. See that? He didn't have a body because bodies are bad. And so he didn't have a body. Let me go on. This is a, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. This teaching, now watch this, led to rampant sin. Those who believe this false teaching claim that when they sinned, it was not them, but that their, it was their body that was sinning. In other words, let's say this. Let's say that I was out somewhere. Let's say I was at Walmart at Bedford and I was doing something and somebody pulled into a parking place I wanted and we got in an argument and I punched a guy right in the nose. And, and the cops came. 
And if I believe this, or if you confronted me on this, here's what I'd say to you. If I believed that, I'd say, look, you can't blame me for that. It was my hand. It's my hand. Listen, when they were caught, when they were caught in a lie or whatever, they'd say, it's not my fault, it's the tongue. Because the body's bad. You see what they did? And so what it did, it opened up, it basically gave them a license to sin, to live however they wanted to live. And sin became very rampant, and, and immorality became just, uh, just rampant as well. And that's why it had to be confronted. And that's why Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Grace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord, according to his divine power, as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. See, he's, he's going to be countering this the whole way through the book. He's going to be countering that teaching, saying, no, this is not right. The body is not bad. It's not bad. The physical was not bad. Whenever God created the heavens and the earth, he said, behold, it is very good. It is not bad. Let, let me go on here. I'll finish this up. So they took no responsibility for their actions, and they just lived in sin. Conclusion. We'll see more of this next week. And I was going to leave you with two verses. Uh, I basically already read them. But watch, I'll read verse four, look, 3 and 4 again of chapter 1. It says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped. See this? Watch how he's countering it having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Look, it shouldn't be a part of our lives. We've, we've been given power to escape it. That's what he's saying. So back to, that's a lot said to say, what's the letter all about? Why did he write it? That's why he wrote it. Because these people were, were coming in. They weren't there yet with the ones that Peter wrote to. Whenever Jude wrote six years later, they had made it. They had got there and they were already teaching it. You see it in the book of Corinthians. You see it in what John writes about how they had come and, and they, they were denying that Christ came in the flesh. He never had a body. That was Gnosticism. That was the dualism. That's exactly what was being taught. And so that's what Peter is going to counter in this letter. Here's, let me give you one more thing about Peter. Something very interesting, I thought. Peter talks more about water than any other writer in the Bible. I don't know if you were aware of that or not. I was not till this past week. He talks more about water than any other writer. You say, what are you getting at? Why is that? Probably very simple. The guy was a fisherman. He was a fisherman. That was, that was what he enjoyed. I could talk to you a lot about construction. I don't know if I do or not. I don't think so. But uh, anyhow... Uh, just some interesting things, and we'll get more as we go through, but you'll see what this group of false teachers, what they taught whenever they come in, and we'll pick that all up. And so anyhow, let's pray. Father, we get a foundation tonight. Uh, Lord, uh, we get a foundation to help us to understand. Peter's the writer. Lord, uh, he's writing from Babylon. He's writing because he is concerned about the false teaching that is fast approaching his listeners, his readers, his audience. Father, they are already here in our day. They're already here. We see it. Those who claim to have a knowledge that exceeds the average Christian's knowledge they see themselves as a little bit above. And so, Lord, they, many of them teach that, that there will no, not be an earthly kingdom. And, Lord, they... They teach that the kingdom is now. Not understanding the Bible from the beginning to the end and knowing what you are working toward, that theocratic kingdom. Father, might we understand that? Might we get equipped? Might you work through me as the pastor? Might I always be growing and learning? Because if I don't grow, then I can't teach anybody to reach a higher level than what I myself reach. So, Lord, I want to learn. I want to grow. You know that. So, Father, uh, as we go into this book, we just pray that you will use our studies in a way that would honor and glorify yourself and in a way that would equip us for the day and age in which we live in. We'll thank you for it all. We pray it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you, Pastor. We'll stand and sing number 115 out of the Ivory Palaces. Number 115, we'll stand and sing verses 1 and 4 in closing. Thank you. 